Invading Earth turned out to be a bad idea. We had thought that it was going to be a simple takeover, with its inhabitants still recovering from a recent world war, and with only one of its nations possessing atomic weaponry. We thought that we could easily subdue the humans. At first, it actually did look like we would pacify the planet easily. Landing on the continent of Europe, which had been devastated by their recent world war, the resistance we received was fierce, but lacking the firepower to stop us. Their primitive explosive propelled kinetic rounds merely bounced off of our armoured vehicles, while our plasma weaponry melted holes in theirs. Their soldiers, lacking in personal body armour, were nothing more than easy pickings for our infantry, whose body armour easily absorbed the impact of their weak gunpowder propelled bullets. Meanwhile, in the skies, their slow aircraft proved to be easy targets for our atmospheric fighters. Within the first week of our invasion, the majority of Europe had been ours, as we split the human forces in the middle, forcing one to retreat to the east, while the other went west. Our push towards the east met continuous success over the next few weeks, as we drove back the armies of the nation known as the Soviet Union. Despite their overwhelming numbers, their vehicles and soldiers were easily destroyed and cut down by our weapons. Intelligence reports estimated that their losses nearly reached a million humans dead, while our own casualties were only a few thousand. Overrunning their cities and keeping their armies on the run, we were able to capture vast areas of their land and conquer the entirety of the Soviet Union four months after we landed. At the Western Front, our push there was also met with success at the start, as we drove back the human armies from the nations known as the United States of America, the British Empire, and the French Republic. Like in the East, we destroyed large portions of their army and forced the humans to retreat farther and farther west. However, our push at that front eventually met unexpected resistance, as we reached the coastline. I must now point out that oceans and seas are a strange thing to us. Back at our home planet, we only had lakes and rivers. Even then, our lakes were nothing more than small bodies of water, where one could see the other side by simply standing at the shoreline. On Earth, however, the bodies of water were huge and vast. Orbital observation has shown us that Earth was mainly covered in water. However, we did not believe this would hamper our invasion, seeing that the humans lived on land. And most, we believe, the oceans and seas would just make the second phase of our invasion a bit more complicated, since our force at Europe had to be lifted up to orbit, before being dropped down again to the planet's surface, this time at the American continent. Due to our home planet's lack of large bodies of water, our race was only able to build shallow water vessels, not the deep water vessels needed to cross Earth's oceans. Because of this, we knew we had to rely on our space shuttles to cross the oceans and seas of Earth. What we did not realise at the time was that humans had perfected the art of building watercraft. Most importantly, they had perfected warfare on it. Yes, we did see orbital images of their ships. The problem was, we did not take them seriously at the time. We thought that the large steel vessels were mainly used for transportation. When we saw that some of these vessels had tubes that looked like larger versions of their land artillery, we shrugged it off, and thought that they too would be inferior weaponry. Our ignorance towards their watercraft eventually became a big mistake. As our forces moved west and cornered the human armies along the coast of the French Republic's homeland, the shipboard artillery that we had so easily dismissed began lugging large high explosive rounds onto our advancing columns. Catching us by surprise, these large caliber rounds destroyed whole formations of soldiers and vehicles. The sight of mangled soldiers and flipped armoured vehicles soon became a common sight at positions within the human ship's range. These ships, we were later learn were called battleships, and they were designed by the humans to fight other large watercraft. The artillery on each ship varied in calibre, but it seemed that the most common bore for the main pieces was 14 inches in diameter. Designed to fire thousand pound rounds at distances beyond the horizon, the original purpose of these battleships was to sink other battleships. However, due to its long range, they were also capable of providing heavy artillery fire for soldiers near the shore. Positioning their battleships close to the shore, these ships would wait for coordinates from observers at the front line before calculating the proper firing solution to ensure their rounds hit the designated area marked by the observer. Once they fired their massive artillery pieces, there was no stopping the heavy rounds from landing and destroying everything near the impact zone. The battleship soon became the human's best weapon at countering us. Suddenly realising the danger these battleships posed, our forces soon began planning how to counter and eliminate them. At first we tried using counter-battery fire, but we quickly learned that this was ineffective, as the battleships would simply move away from the position it had fired its volley from. By the time we had calculated their positions and fired our artillery, the battleship had already left, and our plasma rounds fell harmlessly onto the water. Our second plan at eliminating the battleships was through the use of our atmospheric fighters. 
Capable of flying high and beyond their anti-aircraft artillery, the atmospheric fighters could drop position-guided bombs and directly hit the large ships. However, we soon learned the battleships were robust vessels. Since the humans expected that battleships would fight against hostile battleships, they made sure to protect the vessels with thick layers of armour. Although this did not make them impregnable from our bombs, it did make them difficult to destroy. Due to our reliance on orbital bombardment when eliminating heavily fortified enemy positions, we did not think it was necessary to bring deep penetration bombs for our atmospheric fighters to use, since our orbital drop munitions did the job well enough. However, this meant that the bombs our atmospheric fighters carried were light, high explosive munitions only, not armour piercing. Such munitions only brought minor damage to the battleships, and only during lucky instances were we able to severely disable them. Meanwhile, attempts at dropping orbital munitions on the battleships were also ineffective, since a moving target was hard to hit from orbit. Because of our inability to destroy the battleships that guarded the humans' last hold on the coast of France, we ended up having a stalemate on the Western Front. However, during this lull in the War of Movement, the humans managed to conduct an operation that would eventually turn the war in their favour. At one of the villages that had recently been heavily bombarded by their battleships, a human task force managed to sneak in and recover some of our flipped armoured vehicles and the damaged weaponry and equipment left by our mangrove soldiers. Normally we would have recovered such equipment ourselves, However, the constant heavy artillery bombardment on the roads that led to the village prevented our recovery vehicles from getting close. It was reported that the humans managed to get two heavily damaged plasma field gun armed armoured vehicles, a single lightly damaged armoured personnel carrier, 20 plasma rifles, 13 armoured vests, 4 anti-armoured vehicle guided missiles with launchers, and 2 guided anti-aerial vehicle guided missiles with launchers. It was a small bounty and we doubted that the humans would be able to reuse such damaged equipment. After the humans took our abandoned equipment, they then surprised us by suddenly pulling out their armies from the Western Front, placing them on transport vessels and redeploying them to the island homeland of the British Empire. The humans on the Western Front evacuated their troops and abandoned their holdings along the coast of France. Normally we would have taken advantage of such a retreat, knowing that their front would be weak as they pulled back soldiers from their defences. However, the artillery fire from the battleships prevented us from exploiting their vulnerable state. The next months after their withdrawal became another stalemate with us being unable to land on the British homeland, while the humans were unable to do the same against our positions in mainland Europe. Because of this, we decided to finish our conquest of the Soviet Union before planning for the execution of the second phase of the invasion. After careful planning and preparation, we believed that we could simply leave a small force to guard Europe against any counter-offences from the human armies of the British homeland, while the rest of the army was sent out to conduct the invasion of the American continent. Because of this, we spent the next months consolidating our holdings, while resting and reorganising our forces for the next phase of the invasion. Fifteen months after we first landed in Europe, our forces began the invasion of the American continent. Landing deep in the United States homeland, we hoped to place our forces as far as possible from the range of their deadly battleships. However, to our shock, the landing did not go as planned. Landing near the city of St. Louis, the first wave of our force was surprised to encounter enemy fire as they descended and entered the atmosphere. The landing shuttles were forced to take evasive manoeuvres as dozens of missiles threw up from the surface and guided their way towards each vehicle. This had not been expected, as such weaponry was vastly different from what we had encountered when our forces first landed 15 months ago. Due to these missiles, we had lost 18 out of the 100 landing shuttles that took part in the first wave. However, the missiles were not the only surprise that awaited us that day, as our forces soon encountered human ground forces. Expecting to fight the same weak armoured vehicles and vulnerable infantry, our soldiers were shocked to see streaks of plasma fire erupting from a position ahead of them. At first, some of our units thought that they were encountering friendly fire. However, it soon dawned on our soldiers that the humans were now using plasma rifles and field guns. Now engaging an enemy with equal weaponry, our soldiers struggled to advance as they began to take on heavy casualties. As the fighting continued, and as human resistance stiffened due to the arrival of reinforcements, our forces were then made aware that the humans were not only using plasma weapons, but they also had improved armoured vehicles that our own weaponry had difficulty disabling. Our anti-armoured vehicle guided missiles, which had the ability to penetrate the armour of our own armoured vehicles, were unable to do so against the human armoured vehicles. Reports from survivors of the battle later stated that the humans seemed to have added some sort of explosive armour on their tanks that reduced the damage brought on by our missiles. When it became clear that the landing zone was not clear, we were forced to make the devastating decision of withholding the subsequent waves. Because of this, the first wave that was already on the ground was left alone without support and eventually killed or captured. Only a few hundred wounded, who were placed on shuttles conducting casualty evacuation operations, managed to evade such a fate. 
it soon became clear to us what had happened. The weapons stolen all those months ago had been studied and replicated by the humans. We were first amazed at how fast they were able to copy our equipment and place their version into full production. However, we then felt scared and wondered how many such weapons the humans possessed at that time. Was it only the armies of the United States that were equipped with them? Or were the other armies also armed with the new equipment? It didn't take long for us to know the answer. Six months after the failed invasion of St. Louis, our occupation forces garrisoned the conquered homeland of the Soviet Union began encountering uprisings. It was then reported that the humans who had risen to fight the occupation force were armed with the same plasma rifles used by the soldiers of the United States. We would later learn that the humans had made use of cargo ships to transport the weapons through a sea we thought was too cold for watercraft to safely sail on. Once more, our underestimation of the power of watercraft had resulted in disaster. The next year had our forces on the defensive, as we fortified our gains in Europe while trying to subdue the rebels of the conquered Soviet Union. However, the fight in the east was a losing battle. Although only equipped with plasma rifles, the number of humans they had suddenly thinned our garrison until we were forced to withdraw and reunite them with the main force in Europe. After the loss of the conquered territory of the Soviet Union, our forces began to prepare for the multi-front attack that was expected to come. For five months we waited and prepared, slowly thinking that what we had done was more than adequate to fight off what the humans had for us. However, despite our preparations, the resulting human offensive was beyond that of which we imagined. They first attacked us in the east, with the re-established Soviet Union attacking our defensive line in Poland. Although the humans in this front were still mainly equipped with just plasma rifles, they were now beginning to also field a small number of armoured vehicles equipped with plasma field guns. However, their tactics were still primitive, as they rushed in large waves without proper coordination. Because of this, we were able to hold them off for a month. Meanwhile, in the West, the combined forces of the United States, Great Britain and France, concentrated on an assault on the coast of France. Once more, the battleships played a key role for the humans. However, these battleships were no longer the same vessels that we had first fought three years ago. Equipped with large calibre plasma artillery, their cannons were much more powerful and had longer range than the ones they had used previously. Because of this, they nearly annihilated the defences that we built along the coastline. After the battleship had done their job, the main invasion force of armoured vehicles and infantry landed. Engaging our weakened forces, we were forced to fall back from the coast, as the plasma rounds the battleship's hull bombarded our forces all along the way. Realising that we were being pushed hard on two fronts, and knowing that we stood no chance against the human offensive, we soon began to withdraw our forces deeper and deeper into Central Europe, where we hoped to start evacuating them back to the orbiting fleet around Earth. What followed next was a month of desperate fighting, as our front lines slowly shrunk while we evacuated more and more soldiers and equipment. Despite the intense human efforts, we were somehow holding the line and keeping our evacuation zone clear from the new missile armed jet fighter aircraft the humans were beginning to deploy in large numbers. However, what the humans threw at us next caught us by surprise once more. I guess it was foolish of us to think that the humans could not have thought of something else new for this war. From orbit, we detected an atomic explosion. This was followed by another, and another, and another. We found these explosions odd, as they seemed to be occurring at the ocean the humans called the Pacific. Keeping track of these atomic explosions, we watched as it got higher and higher into the air. As the atomic explosions got closer to space, one of our starships focuses optical equipment at the bursts of atomic explosions and saw something that frightened us all. Riding a stream of atomic fire was a large steel battleship. No, it did not look like the waterborne vessels the humans successfully fought us with, but there was no doubt in my mind that what I saw was a battleship. Shaped like one of those primitive bullets the humans had previously used, and the battleship had some kind of pusher plate on its stern, which absorbed the atomic explosions when the bombs it dropped. Through this very barbaric method, the battleship managed to propel itself into orbit. As it exited the atmosphere and faced towards our fleet of starships, various large panels began to open from its hull to reveal turrets similar to the ones the waterborne battleships had. At this moment, as imminent doom got closer and closer, the order to jump into hyperspace was given. Without hesitation, without even thinking of the soldiers that were still on the surface and fighting a desperate battle in Europe, me and the other starship commanders immediately got our spacecraft away from danger. However, not all of us made it out of the human system. We originally had 100 starships with us, but after exiting hyperspace, it was noted that there were only 98 starships who were with the fleet. We aren't sure what happened to the missing two, but it is speculated by many that they got hit and were disabled by the approaching human battleship. That thought scares me the most. Those two starships contained powerful weaponry and advanced hyperspace drives. Not only that, its computers had star charts that pointed out every star system occupied by our race. 
If the humans manage to recover these things, then there is no telling what they might do. Invading Earth was a mistake, because now we have angered the humans. If anyone in the galactic community has any pity for us, please help my race, because I don't think we would survive if the humans came. Captain Ad Havin, commander of the transport airship Lightbringer, during the invasion of Earth.